Welcome to the Inspirational, Informational, and Transparent Aviation Careers Podcast. You know, if you've ever wondered what being an air traffic controller is like, today I have with me Dawn White, an air traffic controller with over 30 years experience who inspires others through her career coaching. Uh, but before we get started with that, uh, a quick update. The scholarships guide has just been updated. That's that one that we have over $120 million in scholarships in there, and it's only $10 for a year access. You can go and click on the scholarships on the right side of the screen at aviationcareerspodcast.com. And if you want to get a free one, you can actually find one through our Pay It Forward campaign. You can click on the Pay It Forward on the right side of the screen. And if you have questions, just like the questions that came in about what's it like to be an air traffic controller, just go to our contact page. And also, you can directly email us at feedback at aviationcareerspodcast.com. Well, the other thing that I've looked at lately is the fact that, you know, I've been looking outside right now at the, the control tower on the other side, and I've been so inspired by so many people out there talking about their life as an air traffic controller, and they really do keep us safe. And uh, it, is a, it is a career that is, is something that can be a mystery to some people, but I have somebody who's going to help us uh, to actually clarify that, and, uh, and that's Dawn White. Hey, Dawn, uh, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you here. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And uh, actually, so before we begin, uh, I'm here in sunny Florida. Uh, you actually probably a little bit, you're probably not out swimming today this afternoon, are you? You're, we're coming from where again? I'm coming from rainy Vancouver today. <laughs> rainy Vancouver. Uh, so if you've ever been to Seattle, it's very similar weather-wise. It's uh, very beautiful, by the way. If you ever get a chance, go check out uh, Vancouver. I highly recommend it. Uh, some amazing restaurants, sites, and uh, people. Very friendly people up there, that's for sure. Uh, well, Don, let's let's get into this here as far as uh, air traffic control, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a pivot that you made in your career. Uh, so first of all, uh, how did you come about becoming a, an air traffic controller? What got you interested? Uh, great question, because everybody's story is very, very different. Uh, mine is pretty simple. My dad was an airline pilot. And so we grew up um, in days where you could actually fly with him in the cockpit when he did flights and stuff like that. And he would put a headset on me. And from probably six or seven years old, I was fascinated by the person on the other side of the headset who seemed to know everything. And when they said, do this, the pilot did it. Uh, so I was curious about it from a very young age. And when I got to be around 15 or 16, um, I had uh, the privilege of going and visiting one of the local control towers. And I thought, mm, this is pretty cool. I like this. Windows, this is, I could do this. And then I also got to visit an area control center. Um, you guys call them ARTCCs in the States. Same thing, where you have radar scopes, no windows. Uh, and that really fascinated me. So that's where I saw the IFR side of things. And uh, I was hooked. That's, uh, you know, Dawn, that is such a, a great story. I love how people inspire us to get into aviation, but we never know in what way. Um, you know, when you started your story, yeah. I was thinking, oh, I'm going to become a pilot. And then all of a sudden, no, we went to the air traffic control side. So, uh, but no. either way, you were inspired by somebody who was really important in your life. And that obviously it was your father. Um, yeah. And that's, that's something that, by the way, as, and Dawn is really, you know, th we're thankful for her to be here today. That is something that's really important is to actually have people out there that we, that can mentor us uh, like Dawn and all the other people. And you never know where it's going to come from. That's for sure. So, Don, let's talk a little bit about this career as an air traffic controller, because I think yeah. there's a lot of mystery behind it. It seems a, a little scary to some, like, like, oh, gosh, I could never do that. So, you know, what is it, what's it like to be an air traffic controller, and, and why is it such a great career? So, first of all, when I told one of my friends I was going to be an air traffic controller, she thought I was going to be the person on the ramp with the batons, you know, bringing the planes to the gates. That is not what an air traffic controller does. <laughs> um, <laughs> an air traffic controller talks to planes and makes sure that they get from point A to point B safely and that they keep planes apart and they keep planes from the ground. Um, both parts are equally important. Uh, my job is to go in every morning and or every afternoon and whatever the case may be and take over from the person who is 
due for a break or due to go home and just continue the work that is is ongoing. Flights go 24-7, so you never stop. It's never like everybody can just walk away from it. It's it's a constant re- um, revolving door of people from position to position. And I basically sit down, take down the position, whatever's going on, and I will continue the work that is there and just ensure that pilots get what they need and, and that processes are followed. So if you were to name one, maybe two things that you felt was the best part of being an air traffic controller, um, what would they be? The best part about being an air traffic controller, um, I would say the challenge of the job, no two days are ever the same. So when you come in, it's not the same routine thing all the time. I love that part of it. Um, the other part is just feeling that you're doing something important, that you're helping somebody. When you start, you don't think about, it, you know, this plane has 300 people on this plane has 150 people on it. But when you understand that you're getting people from A to B that need to get to vacations and weddings and funerals or you know you see the medevac flights you you realize you're part of a bigger system and you're doing your part and without you things wouldn't work as smoothly so that sense of value I guess is also something that I I really take to that actually sometimes we forget I, I think as pilots as air traffic controllers um is the fact that every day we are actually affecting some great change in people's lives. And, uh, and that's mm-hmm. what, that's one of the things that I appreciate about all the people that work in, in the transportation industry and we're doing it safely. Um, and it takes a lot of sacrifice too. You know, we talk about some yeah. of the pros, the pay is good. That's another one I'm thinking, right? The pay is, is pretty good. So you have a good retirement. Yeah, that is true. I How mean, <laughs> I, I don't focus on it, but yeah, I guess you take, you kind of take it for granted nowadays. Well, yeah, and it's important. You have to make a living, right? It's it's uh, the difference you between uh, you know a hobby and a, and a job. You do have to have something that you can make a good living at. But uh, but one of the things I think that I, you know I hear this quite a bit. And I I like to dispel this is that I always hear people say I can't ever do that. Well, you don't you don't know if, if you can't do something unless you try. Um, and you know we hear how difficult it is to become an air traffic controller and the failure rates and things like that. But maybe we should dispel some of those myths. Um, how did you know that you could actually do this as a job and you, you actually can make it through training? Yeah, I don't think you ever know that you can, to be perfectly honest. But if you have an interest in it, obviously, to start with, like it's something that you think, I would like to do this. That's a start because whatever you're going to do is going to take a lot of grit and determination. It is long hours. It's a lot of studying. So if you like being a student, then that will help you. Um, The other part, training is really difficult because you're always told when you do something wrong. You're told when you do something right, but that's not the focus. So it's this negative reinforcement almost, and it's just part of the way things are. You could have done this better. You did, you know, you missed this. That's not the procedure, whatever the case may be. So you've got to have that resilience piece going into it and, and have a support network around you that can, you know, keep you going when things are tough. But the actual material itself if you're a very calm person, you you like to be under pressure a little bit and push to see what you can do. If you like a challenge, um, it's worth looking at as an option if you've never thought of it before, because we do need a lot of air traffic controllers in Canada. I know, I, I believe the FAA is in about the same boat. Um, we're missing a lot of people and there's a lot of people going to retire here in the next few years. So we're going to be playing catch up for a little while. And I think that in the U.S., definitely we have a shortage in Canada and, and other countries, too. Um, but uh, there's different requirements. There's different ways of going about becoming a controller. And actually, we'll have some links in the show notes. I don't know if you have any uh, suggestion as to a website uh, as far as where they can go, but we definitely will find those and put them down in the show notes. Absolutely. I'll uh, get a couple so, to you, at least the ones from Canada. Yeah. 
Absolutely, yes, yes, absolutely. And by the way, um, uh, one of the thing I, things I wanted to mention, I know we're very uh, U.S. centric as far as the podcast, but um, many of my clients are from Canada and also overseas uh, from the U.S. Uh, mm-hmm. So for those of you in Canada, and, and I've been helping a lot of folks in Canada lately, uh, it is it is different, but it's very similar. The, the In general, in aviation, the aviation world is is similar throughout, and the things that you need to move forward are very much the same. And like you mentioned, resilience is actually a big part of that. And we're going to talk a little bit about mm-hmm. about that later. Um, but air traffic control is really cool. I mean, I think it's great. You're, you're doing something and something that me- is meaningful every day. Uh, the pay is good, um, and I don't know. We'll, we'll pro- try to get some charts in the in the uh, Canada as far as the pay. Obviously, uh, we go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and we put those up on our website, and we'll give you those as far as the the compensation. Um, but there's also some some challenges uh, with this type of a job because uh, you t- you actually mm-hmm. touched on it earlier. It you don't it doesn't go away. It's a twenty four seven type of job. So what kind of a challenges are there in someone's life uh, because of the way that this job is set up? For sure. Uh, I mean, obviously, the biggest and the most obvious one is shift work and fatigue that comes along with that. Um, you know, you're not working a nine to five job. You don't get to go home when necessary. Your body says, I'd like to go home. Uh, so you have to find ways of managing fatigue and, and stress. Uh, and, you know, being aware that for the first few years, because a lot of thing is done on seniority, if you are scheduled to work Christmas, you're going to miss Christmas. And, you know, nobody wants to do that, especially people with little kids. I know as when I was growing up, my dad worked a lot of Christmases. So we had Christmas on December 23rd or December 22nd. So you have to find ways of adapting to the situation. But that can be really challenging for some people that are used to, you know, getting up at seven o'clock in the morning and I can't get up any earlier. I, I don't sleep any later, whatever the case may be. So that that's a big one. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, some people say I'm, I'm a bit Pollyanna sometimes and that I, I always talk about the positives in this job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and full disclosure, trying to be transparent, I went seven years without actually being able to see my family during holidays because of the fact that yeah. I was so junior at so many different jobs, like you said, with the seniority. Uh, but with that said, as you go up in seniority, then you start getting those holidays off and and possibly weekends. And that's a challenge for young people. Similarly, mm-hmm. is that you have maybe not the weekends off and that's when your children have the days off too so that can be a challenge that's for sure you hear um like a lot of the more junior people that are you know really about the work-life balance which i applaud because i don't know that my generation or the generation before had that but there's a lot of overtime that is required to make the system work right now and that's another thing that people should be aware of going in that at least in the short term, uh, there's a lot yeah. more shifts getting worked and long, longer hours that are being worked. So, I love the fact that you mentioned that people are more in tune with the work-life balance. Uh, before, it wasn't like that. I mean, I know starting out, it, it didn't matter. I mean, you're going to work eight days a week, you know, you're going to work every hour. <laughs> so, and that's just the way to, but not anymore. And I love yeah, the fact that no. people are choosing careers based on where their family is or where they want to mm-hmm. live and, and that type of thing. So, uh, so that's great. Um, the other thing, you know, you talk about the, the work, uh, life balance. I think this is true. Uh, cause I hear from other air traffic controllers there, there are times where it can be stressful and possibly that re, that may actually reflect in your home life sometimes. Have you found that or have you seen that happen uh, around your peers? Sadly, yes. I can, you know, in my own life when things have been challenging at times, you come home and, and you're a little bit shorter than you'd like to be with, you know, your family. And um, my family, like my husband is an air traffic controller as well. So I'm really fortunate that he understands what I'm going through and, and the people that I'm talking about when I'm telling these stories. Uh, and he's, he's able to just kind of let me vent and get it out and it's okay. But your family does have to really support you because, you know, you work a midnight shift, you have to come home. You, you can't just keep going at, you know, seven or eight o'clock in the morning, you need to sleep. So somebody else has to take the kids to school or somebody else has to make dinner and, um, that is, you know, your family comes along with this ride for you for sure. It, it's a family event to, to really support somebody that's doing something as challenging as this. 
Yeah, so you do have to bring them all in uh, and tell them, hey, this is what's going on. Communications is, is so important in that environment. Mm-hmm. But, you know, one of the things that you talked about earlier is just the fact that you like to help people and, uh, and you are making a difference in people's lives. And that actually has led to this career pivot, say career 2.0 yeah. or, or whatever we want to call that. Um, and you've decided to go into coaching, which I think is, is terrific. Obviously, I'm, I'm a big fan of that because I, I do career coaching every day that I'm off from my flying right. job. Uh, so what what made you decide to become a coach? And what, and what type of coaching do you do? So I didn't necessarily decide I was going to do it. It was, it was, again, one of those things where COVID hit and I was in a role at the time that was all, it was traffic management. So I was dealing with demand and capacity imbalances, right? If there was too many airplanes and not enough airspace or, you know, the arrival rate was too low, we would distribute delay equitably amongst all the airlines and and airplanes and aircraft that were coming in. Of course, with COVID, (laughs) there was no demand and capacity issue. So my job was made redundant. And I needed to figure out what came next. And while I was waiting for that piece to fall in, I found that uh, what I thought I was going to be really resilient through that was not going to be a big deal turned into be a much more challenging mentally and emotionally than, than I expected it to be. And I basically went, I have to figure out something for myself, like to keep my sanity through all this. And I ended up taking a coaching course which ended up being almost therapeutic for me. But through the coaching program and getting my coaching diploma, I realized that I couldn't have been the only person going through this and that the sense of purpose and value that it gave me in my life, I wanted to share with other people. So that was kind of how I got into the coaching thing. It was more, let's take care of Dawn. And then when I found that it worked for me, I thought, okay, let's see if I can offer this to somebody else. And of course, I've been doing the mentoring um, aspect of the job as well. You know, I have lots of friends that say, hey, I have a friend that's interested in ATC. Can they come in and, and work, sit with you for a while and see what it's all about? So the two pieces go really hand in hand. And that's basically what I've taken and, and kind of run with on the side, you know, when I'm not doing ATC. So as far as air traffic control, uh, that has to fit in with this and kind of a balance. It is a life work balance there also. Uh, and, yeah. and you and I have, have that similarity because um, I keep getting reminded by my wife is that you can't work every single day that you're, you're off. And, um, <laughs> and, and interestingly, to full disclosure, I've actually changed my life to only work eight hours a day on my days off. Uh, I used to open it up to 14 hours and, uh, and I say only, and I'm, and, and, you know, I'm a bit of a workaholic, uh, and that's kind of just, that's also another issue you have to kind of work on, but the coaching part of it can actually become all encompassing and become, uh, mm-hmm. actually more work than the job of being an air traffic controller. So Absolutely. how do you, how do you do have that life balance? And then I, I want to kind of ask you a question about uh, a term that you used. So how do you go about that but work life balance now that you have the air traffic control job and then yep. you also have the coaching? Yeah, it, that's a really good question. And that one is one that still challenges me day to day. And what I basically do is I have my work schedule and I try to keep that work schedule as not minimal, but just honor what that is, because that is been my bread and butter and and I love my job. Beyond that, I think about the other things that I want to do in a day, whether it be spend time with my family or get exercise or sleep or, you know, just do the things around the house. And then I take and block off time to work on uh, the coaching business, to deal with clients, to do things like this, you know, the social media aspect is, is big. Um, that's how I've basically found the balance. And if I ever find that I'm doing too much or, you know, not enough, then I, you know, sit down and go, okay, where can we give? And, and my family is really good at saying, okay, Dawn, mom, whatever, you're not around or go, we're okay. You know, so they've, they've been really, I'm blessed that way. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I found important also is uh, to have your family tell you, hey, listen, you need to, I'm blocking your schedule and we're just going to have a day for the family and that's it. Uh, And I've been doing that more and more. 
uh, and uh, and I think that's incredibly important. We're very kindred spirits here. I think this is awesome. But we're we're kind of learning from each other here by we're, by yeah, talking absolutely. too, which is terrific. Uh, but uh, but not to make it a coaching session. We we should. Uh, one of the things <laughs> that you <laughs> you talked about is uh, resilience. You said that you. Uh, yeah really had to learn how to have resilience in your life. Um, for those that don't quite understand, you know, maybe what that term means, how would you explain resilience, especially as it applies to your life and your career? Yeah, um, resilience has become my passion project. And, and again, I kind of tripped into it. And um, it, it was it's a, a concept that just really resonated with me when I was going through that coaching training and, and that more challenging career piece that I had in the last three, four years. Um, a lot of people think resilience is just bouncing back, which it totally can be. Um, but the only issue that I have with, you know, thinking resilience is about bouncing back is if you don't bounce back to where you were before whatever challenge or change kind of affected you, then a lot of people can feel like they've somehow failed. And that's not true because if something's changed in your life, you're not where you were. You maybe as a person aren't the same person anymore. So if everything's different, how can you go back to where you were before? So um, I really like the definition that says, you know, it's, it's the process and it's the outcome of adapting to difficulties and challenges in life. And not just, you know, emotionally, but mentally and um, spiritually, and then adapting to adapting to the demands that come externally, internally. So it's, it's that flexibility and and adaptability piece that I, I really, I really want to emphasize. Yeah, adapting and overcoming are, are very important things. And, and obviously, a lot of my clients are, are from the Marine Corps. And that's one of the biggest mm-hmm. things they talk about is adapting and overcoming, but not just in the military, but also in your, your personal life. Um, so as far as, as resilience is concerned, um, what as, a, as an individual, what normally holds us back from being resilient in our lives? As much as we'd like to think we're totally unique, we're not in this respect. A lot of us will go through the exact same phases uh, when you're faced with a challenge. And one of the very first things you're going to do is you're going to resist it because your brain hasn't had the time to process, you know, what does this mean to my life? Uh, What is the impact to things around me? Um, So again, you know, I almost picture a dog with its hand, its paws out going, I'm not going for a walk. Like you're just going to have to drag (laughs) me forward. Um, So that's the first thing you're going to do. You're going to resist. And then there's a lot of reasons behind it. There's, and those are unique from person to person, but um, you know, usually loss of control, something about control being gone is the first reason that we will, will resist. And, and that's, Hey, I'm a controller. I'm type A. I'm the first one to admit it. And if, if things don't go just the way I want, I struggle, but I'm learning what to do when I recognize those signs in myself. And that's what I want to encourage other people to do is be aware of what's going on in their brains and their bodies when, when they're faced with challenges. So that's one for sure. So with that said, there there are ways uh, to become more resilient, but it's a process. It's not just you know what we're talking about here, and that's a, a big part of what I think you're doing. And uh, that's at mm-hmm. uh, the, at your and if someone's listening, by the way, you can find out more at her website at dawn and uh, w h y t e dot c a dot uh, and that's the website there. So dawnwhite.ca. Right. and and we'll have the link by the way in the show notes. Um, so if I was someone that wanted to become more and have more resilience in my life personally, and also in my career, uh, that's one way to do that is to speak to somebody. And, uh, and I think that's uh, very important having a coach. Um, and, uh, and that is part of what you do. So, so explain to us a little bit more about that, you know, how you can get more resiliency through, through basically like your coaching that you do. Yeah. So with my clients, you know, one of the very first things that I, I talk to them about is uh, resilience is is not an end goal. It is a journey. Um, I think a lot of people, when they say, I'm going to be resilient, think, OK, it's like I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to get the promotion. Like there's at some point you can just tick a box and go there. I've done it. It's not. It's a constant work in progress. I went through a lot of challenges pre-COVID and I thought I was a fairly resilient person so that when I went through that job amalgamation um, period that I went through, 
I thought, oh, I'll just, you know, flip back to what I was five years before. And I didn't. So it is realizing that there are steps that you need to be taken and you have to work on it almost every day um, to to get good at it. Um, one of the biggest things is the your mindset, right? You have to be in a a growth mindset where you're willing to say, I can, I can do this. I, I can adapt. Uh, this is maybe not my ideal situation, but I can learn and I can find something that's of value to me so that I can move forward rather than just sitting there going, nope, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. So that is a huge, huge piece. And it's working with clients a lot of time in, the, in those early stages to go, okay, what would you like to see come out of this? That is a positive for you that resonates with you that connects with your values, understanding what your values are, is really important. Um, you know, having family and, and a support network around to help you through it, going to a coach, going to a mentor, finding somebody that you work with that you can confide in, that can all help um, your the, the journey that you're, you're going to start. I Absolutely. could go on for ages, but you know, those are, <laughs> those are two big ones that you could start with. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. I love the fact that you talk about mentors, coaches, et cetera. Uh, it, it may not be a formal coaching session. We have many people in our lives uh, that can be mentors and can be coaches and help us. It's, uh, but you have to be also careful about who you share with. You know, you have to kind of test those waters because there are some people that are positives in your life and some that are negatives. You want to move towards those that are positives. And obviously somebody who's a, a coach that you hire is going to be a positive in your life, or at least we hope so. But but yeah. that's something that's that's really important is to choose uh, you know a person that's going to help you. And when you can't get help and you and you run across this dead end where you don't know who to turn to, that's where the internet's been great. You can find people. You know that's how I got into coaching. I needed help. Uh, I had I have a speech issue, and uh, mm -hmm. I've had to have some classes in speech and learn how to to overcome those speech impediments. And not that, and most people say, gosh, I don't really notice it ever. And it really is, but it's something I've had to work on constantly. So I've had to be resilient in that, in, in mm -hmm. my ability to try to, to stop this condition and prevent this condition from happening and coming out throughout uh, my my actions online and also my, my speaking. Uh, and people are like, gosh, I didn't know that about you. You know, I probably don't mention that very often that I had a, had a speech issue, but I, everybody has something, you know, has some kind of challenge. And look, I became a podcaster. I overcame it. You know, I went the other direction and that's where someone like yourself can help is, uh, is actually through that coaching. Most of the people that you coach, are they, are they aviation or are they, uh, other, just uh, other different careers? Well, first of all, I, I got to acknowledge what you just said, because it's huge to be vulnerable and, and put yourself out there and say, hey, this is a shortcoming that I have. And this is how I overcame it. Because I think a lot of times we think, oh, I can't do this. But you can, you know, we're just average people doing average things, but with some extraordinary results. So um, thank you for sharing that. The other part to your question, um, most of them have been in the aviation business because I understand you know, stressful um, roles, what that does to you, um, shift work, just the aviation community in general. And it hasn't been just pilots or controllers. I've worked with um, students. I've worked with um, people that work for airport authorities, you know, but for the most part, it's been in the aviation field because I understand that, that side of it. Um, I think, you know, life coaching, aviation coaching, resilience coaching, call it whatever you want, it's very much like what you said, Carl, we're all just trying to help each other be the best version of ourselves we can be. And you get into these ruts or you get stuck in a spot. And, you know, my role as a coach and what I want to do is help people get out of those ruts and recognize their strengths and their weaknesses and find ways to move forward. So that's, that's kind of the coaching that I've been doing for the most part. So Dawn, how can they find you if they want to get coaching either in the aviation side or in life coaching? So I am on, um, well, like you said, I have a website, www.donwhite, my name, white with a Y, <laughs> uh, I am on Instagram and LinkedIn. And I think I gave you the, the links to that. Did yep. I not, Carl? So Absolutely. hopefully and, we can uh, share well, those. Yeah, we'll definitely share those in the show notes. That's for yeah. sure. Uh, Don, I know we're running out of time, but uh, any, any last... Uh, 
you know, comments as far as both on the air traffic control side, if someone's looking towards that as a career, what should they do next? They know nothing about it. And also on the side from a, from a life coaching uh, perspective, what should they do if they, they need help? Air traffic control, one of the most amazing careers, in my opinion, out there. If you are at all interested, find more information online, contact me, even say, what do you think? I am happy to have a conversation with you and tell you a little bit more about what my day looks like um, and some of the other pros and cons that that you'll find there. And, and of course, you can certainly check out FAA websites or in Canada, navcanada.ca has tons of information there about it. Um, you know, and, and if you go online, you'll find a lot of air traffic controllers probably have social media profiles as well and just kind of seek those ones out. Just an alternative. Um, as for life coaching, it's never too late. If you are in a position where you're not 100% sure that it's where you want to be and you want more for yourself, reach out. You know, you made a very good point that uh, coaching should be a positive, but that's if you are in a space where you're willing to do it and you connect with the person that you're working with. Um, and if you don't find that person right off the bat, don't quit. Find someone else because um, it, life is never over. It can always be better than it is. So keep looking forward. Absolutely. Some great advice, Dawn. This has been awesome talking to you. Uh, you've inspired Thank me you. and uh, you hopefully have inspired our listeners and I know you have. Uh, and if you want to know more about air traffic control or the coaching, it's easy. Just go to aviationcareerspodcast.com. Go to our contact page. If you have a question, maybe we'll have Dawn back on. Maybe she'll come on again. We'll answer some of those questions about what it's like to be an air traffic control. I know that in the past when we've had an air traffic controller on and has actually explained something that they've done and showed us even in a video uh, that's been very popular because you actually get to see the inside scoop and what happens there. Maybe we'll have uh, Dawn on again just to kind of explain maybe a, a specific clearance and that type of thing. I think that'd be a lot of fun. I would be happy to come back and, and, <laughs> and really hone in on that one side because I know we covered a lot of things today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's more. And, and there's so much here. We could sp speak for hours. Uh, and I would love to talk more about, you know, from the from the perspective of a career uh, and be a little bit more in depth and more detail, maybe do a deep dive on the process. Maybe we'll go through that at some point. But the most important absolutely. thing, I think, is to actually reach out. Reach out to Dawn, dawnwhite.ca. Again, there's going to be links in the show notes to the everything, all all of her social media. And of course, you can ask us at, uh, you know, aviationcareerspodcast.com slash contact. Dawn, once again, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, one of the most important things you can do for me after listening to Dawn or any of the things that I've said here is after you've stopped the video, you've stopped listening on your podcatcher is don't stop there. Keep moving forward. I think the most important thing you can do whenever you're trying to pursue any goal is to continually take steps forward every single day. It may be something really small. It could be something like checking out uh, Dawn's website at dawnwhite.ca, or it could be actually writing into us with a question. It could also be just thinking, thinking about what's the next part of your journey. It could be scheduling that check ride. But whatever you do, please do this for me. Take one step each and every day to move forward towards your career goal in your life. And I am sure that you will be successful. We'll, we'll talk to you next episode. Safe flying out there.